Hello, 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 hello. I am Grandmaster Dennis Borsch. You are watching me talking on the Chessweep channel. Yeah. So, the topic of this stream slash lecture is Billy the Kid. I mean, Billy the King's Indian chess player. So, now we're going to a little bit investigate the past, the history of the King's Indian. So we're not going necessarily to look at specific problems or issues with the King's Indian. We're actually going to try to understand the building blocks of the kid. And we're going to start from there. And I see the chat already going wild with ideas, which is good, which is good. Also, let me say hi's and hellos. Hello there, Jimster, my sick duck, the real Keen King, little. So, in order to understand the concepts and ideas in these structures, you have to understand what the fight is all about. And you're looking at it. And on the other hand, I'm curious about your knowledge about the King's Indian. For you who's watching this in the future and you just watching it right now. Hello there. So when we talk about King's Indian, which players do come to mind for yourself? For me, honestly, Fisher does come up one of the first ones. Fisher would be my first pick. And Yefim Geller. But I see Chet has different views. So I see Kasparov, Nakamura, so Hikaru and Kasparov. Yeah, I see some people had some love for the opening, but then... Love dies eventually, as I see, and it reverted to different ways of playing. John Nunn says, I sick duck, yeah? Hello there, pixie full pavement. So we actually did list some important names. Obviously, Yefem Geller is a household name when you're thinking about the King's Indian. But there are other names that you think that is surprising. It's going to be surprising. You think that, hey, this guy is too solid to play the King's Indian. And it turns out he's such a great player. Gadranov is saying Swidler. Swidler was also a big fan of the King's Indian, but reverted to the Grunfeld. In fact, in some ways, I feel that. Um, you know, the King's Indian and the Grunfeld has some sort of similarities, and I'll explain it a little bit later. So we're talking about legends, not upcoming players. And I'm looking at the chat. It's kind of funny as I see <clears throat> some players labeled, you know, they're getting there. For Yarden von Forest is pretty good. But he's not at Yefim Geller's st stature just yet. So there are obviously famous people who say that the King's Indian is horrible and just going to destroy you. And that person is famous for his Karpov matches and his will to demolish the King's Indian. And he's, of course, Viktor Korchnoi. But this time we're not talking about legends who are famous King's Indian slayers, but players who you wouldn't have expect to be such a pro King's Indian players. And he is so iron and such a, such a solid player, Iron Tigran.
Iron Tigran. Does that name ring a bell to you, dear viewer? Petrosian, yes. So Petrosian, you wouldn't expect him to be a big expert with black, but in fact he was and had some fantastic results. It is indeed Tigran Petrosian, the real keen king. And so I want to show some of his games and let's try to understand how to play the King's Indian according to Iron Tigran. With that, let's get into it. Study. And let's start with this game where he's facing Grigoli Leuvenfish. Also, let's flip the board. <clears throat> Is any of you familiar with Grigoli Leuvenfish? In fact, Grigori Leuvenfish is famous for many, many respects. One of them is that he was idolized by none other than Viktor Korchnoi, which is not something to sneeze at, and also Gazundheit. So Grigory Levinfish is actually famous for being Russian slash Soviet champion and also for tying the McMaster of Botvinnik, Mihal Botvinnik. Yes, that is also too true, Crow, Crow F B5. You King King. Whoa, you've got our emote. How did you get that? Hmm. Interesting. And famous for the Leuven fish attack as well. So, in this game, Vartanovich Petrosian is playing against Grigory Leuvenfish. Let's take a look. D4, Bishop G7, G3. Now, whenever you play it with D6, this is the king's indian if you push it too far it's the grunfeld i already mentioned that i feel that there's some resemblances of the grunfeld slash the king's indian because even though they seem like stark contrast but that's not quite true both the king's indian and the grunfeld is trying to undermine the white's center the only difference being, in the Grunfeld, black is trying to undermine the center immediately. As you can see, black just played d5, hoping to find target on d4 as the position opens up. Let's say here, just to look at the main, main line. c4, c5, etc., etc. You put pressure on d4, and that's the main point of counterplay here. Now, when you're playing the King's Indian, you are not undermining the center immediately. But the eventual goal is to undermine the center of white. Bishop g7, g3, e4 is the other way of playing, but Leuvenfish is playing solidly. Castle, d6. Hello there, St. Louis Chess Club. How is it going? So here, d6, black will plan to break it open with e5. So instead of breaking it open with d5, black decides to open it up with e5. Knight f3, knight e7, castle, e5, e4. <clears throat> and here, we have to think about the situation. How can we try to play this position with black? Now, remember, I will, time, I will stop time after time just to understand the position. And let's try to think with our heads, try to understand 
how the King's Indian is supposed to be played. Duck, it is correct, actually. It's just adding an extra hour for some strange reasons. So we can maybe, as Chad is saying, asking, we could try to break it open. Yes, that is true. So what will be Black's plan after White plays d5? That's an important question, by the way. We need to answer that, otherwise this opening would be labeled unplayable. What is the big plan after d5? Now, I'm not saying what moves would you make, but what would be the strategic idea once White closes the position? <clears throat> Maybe knight d8, f5. Yes, Gadran, exactly. So here, Vartanovich played rook e8. Could have tried to take on d4 as well. Similar, a little bit similar to the Grunfeld type of play. Black would try to put pressure on the e4 pawn and sometimes on the c4 as well. But we'll see how this plays out later. Anyways. Just to show, let's say a5, d5, and black can go knight h5 and prepare f5, or go knight e8 and prepare f5. Now, that's interesting, but what is white trying to achieve in these type of positions? Because now we have a straight and clear plan, what black is trying to do. But what is white trying to do in, in these type of positions? So it's clear black wants to break it open with f5. And this is what I wanted to talk about to you guys, that even though the Grunfeld seems totally different to the King's Indian, the concept is the same. White, I mean black, is trying to open up and break white's center, or if not, go and attack with a kingside attack. So as Gadranov points out, white is planning to go knight e1, knight d3, but mostly is planning to play on the queen side because has more pieces over there, and if c5 could come, there would be a disadvantage on that side. Hello there, Fuxia. Somebody mentioned knight h, h6, knight h5. But let me pinpoint out something which is very important. So let's say h6, rook b1, just preparing this maneuver, knight h5, let's say a3. Now a4 would be nice, but then I would be able just to take it. Knight c5 doesn't work because b4 and white is winning some tempo, chasing away this knight and can start rolling with the pawns. And f5, as mentioned before, actually doesn't work. Why doesn't f5 work here? And this is a very important thing to note if you want to understand these structures of a black. f5 actually does not work. And please, if you have a solution, Give me more than one move, because one move is not an explanation. Indeed. Hello there, Quasi Quest. So F5, problem is takes, and if you take with the rook, one thing you run into these forks, which you have to avoid. Also, I will have the e4 square, and that will be bad news. So gf is strategically mandatory. Now, the problem is, this knight is not defended, and there is this counter tactic with knight takes e5, and black is struggling. So knight takes e5, and the point is, 
that this knight is hanging and it's not defended at all. So we know that. How can black prepare the idea of f5? Black is poised to play f5. We know that f5, e, f, g, f, knight takes e5 happens and it just doesn't work. Exactly, Machet. Queen e8. So one of the ways, now the problem is there's knight b5 and that's a little annoying, but queen e8 as a concept is important because let's say if white would be ignorant, we can go f5, e, f, g, f, and there's no more tactics on e5 because the knight is defended. Now, if you're not used to these hanging pawns, well, you've got to get used to it in the King's Indian because that's the source of counterplay here. So something to remember, if you want to play it with knight h5 and f5, a lot of times queen e8 f5 is the way to play. And another thing to note, even if you go, let's say, knight e8, what else do you have to look forward to and have to think about before you could play f5? So there's th these two big plans whenever the position closes up. So the real king king is said, I said knight c5 and a4 before anything. So the thing is, that's just a way of stabilizing the position. But that's not the whole goal. So you go f5 after stabilizing, but the real king king, you still don't focus on the most important part. Does f5 even work? Anam Haya, thank you for raiding with a party of 90. Hope you had a great stream. And also, shout out to Anam Haya. Go check her out. She's a main, main bullet player. She's pretty good. You're just looking at some classical, classical ideas in the King's Indian and we try to understand how it works. Thank you so much. Okay, so does F5 work at the moment? That is the big question. Coco Spoko, thank you for following. So it doesn't. So we do need to prepare that idea with h6. So whatever we do, let's say rook b1, we must play h6, stopping any of these knight g5 ideas. Because here, there's knight g5, and knight e6 can be very painful in these type of positions. So that's why you play h6, and then you can start rolling with f5. So, but that didn't happen. Actually, Tigran Petrosian, who's a superb King's Indian player, says, Rook e8, I am preparing the attack on the e4 pawn. On the other hand, I'm not really concerned. If the d pawn is pushed, I can still go back. There's nothing wrong with knight c5 in general, ruthless Brit, but that's not the whole concept of the King's Indian. That is just a stabilizing move. So rook e8 is played. Rook e1, a5. And it's kind of interesting the way Petrosian plays it. Mr. Nobody, thank you for following. 
Tigran is not showing his true intentions. H3. And now you have to decide what to do. A5 Dortam might seem weird, but the point is it plays against a future rook b1, a3, and b4 plan. So Leuvenfisch played h3, and now let's try to decide how should we proceed here. Can we consider this position closed? Yes, no, yes, no. No, not yet, no. Mm -hmm. So any plans? Do we have any plans at the moment? Can we start an attack on the king side with black? And that's an important question, by the way. I'm not just asking it to be coy and educational. It's an important question. Can we launch an attack on the king side if it's still an open position. So I see some yeses, noes. Actually, it's the same guy. <laughs> we can't. Not really. Enzi says, not really. Why not, chat? Why not? Well, exactly so. As Crazy Quest points out, White can counter in the center. I thought that something's leaking or something, but it ain't, so that's good. So we can't really open it up. White might open up the position on us. So we have to change plans. So if we can't attack with f5 and the position isn't closed, how can black continue here? Well, we can't wait for that long, Lil. We can't wait forever. We need to find counterplay. If you don't find counterplay, They'll destroy you. That's 101 rule of the King's India. Yes, takes on d4. Strong decision. Why? So just like in the Grunfeld, Black will be looking counterplay, looking for counterplay against the king. I mean against the e4 and c4 pawns. Knight takes d4, knight c5. Queen c2. So far, does white have enough defenders on the e4 pawn? And Dortam has a good point. Now see, a5 made sense, as there's no b4. It's just guarding against that, and now we have a very nice little pony on c5. Hello there, everyone. And by the way, you can join us on our Discord and Facebook if you want to see more of these lectures in the future. Yep, enough defenders on E4. But the good part about the King's Indian that it involves tactics. And here, there's a very little fine idea that Petrosian spotted against Leuvenfish. Does that everybody know who Leuvenfish is? And if not, let me just repeat, he is a very famous grandmaster. Viktor Korchnoi was a big fan of him. And also, Leuvenfish is famous for tying a match with Mihal Botvinnik, the world champion, in a real match, by the way.
He's a very famous grandmaster. And yeah, Crazy Quest, you're correct. He invented the F4 system against the dragon. But let's come back to this game. There's a very typical maneuver and tactical idea that Petrosium will use in this position. What could that be? Thank you for the follow. Yay, Drew. So I see knight takes e4 suggested. Which is an interesting idea. What else? So one of the things that's very important in chess, if you look for a good move, and if you find a good move, try to find a better one. That's very important. So knight e4 is definitely an idea. I'm not saying it's bad. Let's look for another good move. Skaborovich just found the right quote. If you see a good move, look for a better one. Exactly. So if you're doing nothing, exactly nothing in this type of position, what are the chances for black? Well, you're going to get destroyed. So, we realize that this guy on d4 is a little bit loose. Let's try to play on that idea. So knight e4 is one of them. How else can we use the fact that the d4 knight is undefended? So it got to be a move with this pony, of course. So the other move is knight g4. Now knight g4 might not seem like a good move, and knight g4 was played. An interesting idea by Petrosian. Now this move seemed like a tactical one, but the fact is Knight g4 has a positional basis, meaning this knight is going towards e5 and attack this loose square on d3. Mind you, this pawn on e2 would protect against that, but pawns don't move backwards, so this pawn is not going to help against this maneuver. Now, knight takes e4, knight takes e4, takes... There's this annoying move of bishop g5. You move the queen, there's knight f6 check. At worst for white. And with this bishop missing, white has big compensation. And white might even be just simply better here. If you play f6, which you should never do, white can just take, take, check, fork down, and the rook is gone. So not every pawn that looks tasty is good. Some of them are poisonous. So therefore, knight takes e4 is not a good idea. But knight g4 is. So if you take with the pawn, I take on d4, I will have a very strong bishop attacking on f2 and a potential target on g4. And with this bishop, 
just staring at that e4 pawn, it's clear that black is the one calling the shots. Someone's asking, why not knight d7 instead of knight g4? It is kind of simple. Knight g4 has some attacking ideas against f2, and it's way more forcing. You could play knight d7, but you're only attacking this bishop. I mean, this bishop only attacks the d4 knight, and I could potentially play bishop e3 here. Now look at knight g4 not only attacks that f2 pawn, it all, of course, stops this idea of bishop e3 as well. Therefore, knight g4 is superior. Now, is knight g4 winning? Not by a lot. It's not winning, but it improves Petrosian positions greatly. Thank you for the follow, Tangu Somerset. Knight b5. Knight b3 obviously is a decent move, but I don't think that black would be much worse. You are going to start attacking that c4 pawn, and black will get good counterplay here. Why doesn't bishop e3 work? The reason bishop e3 doesn't work is because I can just capture you. You can't capture back with the rook. Because the d4 knight is hanging, and if you have to take with the pawn, then that's positionally is just lost for white. Knight b5, which is a little bit strange, but does defend the knight, and now this knight is hanging. And of course, we bring the knight where? Of course, to e5, knight e5. So again, let's summarize what happened. White was waiting. Black felt that, okay, I have enough counterplay against the knight and against these loose pawns. So he decided to go for this knight g4, knight e5 idea. This is a potential target. Also, which square is our goal in this position with black. Yes, exactly, Dinakis. The d3 square can be a juicy target for those knights. That's one thing. So there's the d3 square that we might want to play against, the c4 pawn. Also, where else can we find the target? in white's position. Bishop takes h3 is not really a target yet because I can just capture back and you don't have knight f3 check. If you would have knight f3 check, it would work, but it doesn't work. So where are white's loose pieces? Or where will be some loose pieces for white? Which square? Rook on e1, but it's very hard to get close to that one. Crazy quest. But what are you loosening, Ninja, Ninja Kappa, when you play c6? That was the main question. And that is still the main question. The d4 will get extremely loose, right? So that's why you want to play c6. And you realize that this knight is more important than that weakness on d6. Because whenever you push that c pawn, that d pawn becomes a slight bit of a target or weakness. So positionally, the King's Indian is a strategic system and risky. 
because the d6 pawn will be a target towards the end game. But at the moment, because we have dynamic play, it doesn't matter. So Leuvenfish plays rook d1, which is a strong move for one important reason. It's overprotecting the d4 knight. c6, knight a3. Now knight a3 is not a happy move. You don't want your knight on the rim. But knight c3 is not possible because the c4 pawn is hanging. So knight a3. But on the other hand, even though black has very active pieces, black will need to find some targets. Otherwise, there'll be some problems on the road. So, Petrosian plays queen c7, a precaution against this x-ray. Bishop e3. And now is another critical moment. The critical moment. Let's think about this position. So we have beautiful knights on e5 and c5. White's pieces are, by the way, not that bad. This is protected. This knight is stopping any f5 ideas. There are some issues, though, for Leuvenfish. This knight on a3 particularly is terrible. That means black has some extra time to come up with a good plan. So what are we playing for in these positions in the King's India? What do you think, chat? What are we playing against? And this is very important. Otherwise, you can't play the King's Indian if you don't understand the core concept of it. If you cannot improve your pieces positionally anymore, play dynamically. Gaborovich, a wonderful point. So follow that quote by Gaborovich, and you'll find the idea that white, I mean, black should be aiming for and white should be trying to avoid. Now, is white's pieces misplaced? Not at all. That means black will need to refocus his pieces. The first question is, what can we target in White's position? So first, let's identify White's weaknesses. What are White's weaknesses? So there's a difference between being vague, as V Smooth says, attack on the king side. That's not enough. We want real targets that are on the board. Tortam says h3. Gaborovic says h3 and e4. That's a great start. h3 and e4. Now we just have to decide which one we can come closer to. So, can we come close to the h3 pawn? Is that possible? No, we can't. And in fact, as my sick duck pointed out, if bishop d7, queen c8, you go here, this is a huge mistake. And this often happens in blitz games. Bishop d7 is terrible. It's white to move and win. Bishop d7 would be a terrible blunder. Because f4 and suddenly this knight is gone. You can't go back. And it's just trapped in the middle of the board. You can't even go to d3 because I'll take you. And I'll be just dominating with white. So, 
they realize that we can't really go bishop d7, queen c8. Also, there's just king h2 if push comes to shove. So we can't attack the h3 pawn. What do we have left then to do if the h3 pawn cannot be a target? If the h3 is well defended, there's one more target that we can go against. No limit, rook f8 is, do is doing nothing exactly because it doesn't attack anything. So we want to target this pawn on e4. How can we encircle it? You already have one attacker on it. And the fact is, sometimes you can't be just aggressive with pawns. Sometimes you've got to be smart with your pieces. Knight d7. Regrouping. Where is that knight going? Chat, where is that knight going? Well, to go in to f6, and then black will have lots of pressure against the e4 pawn. Now, what was wrong with ideas of playing with f5? f5 is not a bad move in general, but here specifically, we're playing as that e4 pawn. If you exchange it off, also it loses a pawn right now, but let's say rook f8, f5. If you exchange off your opponent's weaknesses, you clearly will have no targets at all. That's why Petrosian played knight d7 just to put more pressure on the e4 pawn. Duck is saying, shouldn't black exchange pieces cause less space? Well, dogmatic play never leads to great solutions. And as you can see, Petrosian is not dogmatic. He is willing to go back with the knight just to undermine that e4 pawn. So the question is, what can white do in this position? And I know we're trying to understand the position from a black's perspective, but in a chess game, you must look for the best solution for your opponent as well. And the next move by Leuvenfish is a strong one. So a lot of times it's enough just to pinpoint which pieces of whites are misplaced and are on terrible squares. No limit. The problem with your idea of preparing e5 somehow, that it is a bit of a wishful thinking. Your opponent is trying to take your e4 pawn and you're trying to push them away. No, you need to defend your weaknesses first. Yeah, the knight on a3 is misplaced. So knight b1, and this is the moment when you realize these are grandmasters of the highest level. Leuvenfish is reorganizing his setup so he can meet 9f6 with 9c3 and then it will be still a tense match. So knight b1 is an x clan worthy move. It's a strong one.
So if we think about this position for a second, we'll stop here. What will be White's future plan? After knight c3, where will White mostly concentrate his efforts? Attack the d6 pawn, yeah. But the d6 pawn is on which side of the board? Yes, Dinekis and Dortum, the queen side. So eventually, let's say here, here, white might go a3 and b4. Petrosian, realizing this, decided to stop that and didn't even play knight f6 immediately. And he started to play against these future pans of Leuvenfish. And as Ruthless Brit points out, a4. It is playing against b4 moves, and if b4 ever happens, that kind of activates this bishop on g7. Knight c3. And once we actually manage to play a4, black will eventually get some good play. Knight e5, trying to play against the c4 pawn. Knight c2. Now the question is, how should we continue in this position? We have a stable knight on c5, which is a good thing. But where will be our future target? What will be our future target in this position? And then we'll, we'll have an easy time guessing what black should be playing next. The b2 pawn is a potential target. What else? There are more than one targets in this position. Queen a5, says the ruthless Brit. Why would you play queen a5? What's your goal? What are you trying to achieve with that? Whenever you're making a move, always make sure that it has a purpose. If it doesn't have a purpose, maybe it's not too good. So if you play queen a5, what's the purpose of it all? Thank you for the follow, Mike Kane 3000. So the point of queen a5, and it was played by Petrosian, is to play queen b4, hitting this b2 pawn, and attacking this c4 pawn. So it has lots of purposes behind it. Also, there are no b pushes anymore, because I take and can give my queen away for two rooks, which tends to be very pleasant for black. Monkle 36, thank you for following. Rook c1. Someone say a3, but what's the problem with a3? In fact, a3 would be a pretty bad move. Even though it would consolidate by its position a little bit, it would lose its flexibility. Mostly that there would be no b4 breaks anymore. Because black can just take, and there'll be just way too many weaknesses in the position. So Lovenfish decides just to play the cool and smooth rook c1. So now, we have critical moment, probably number three. This is number three, I think. Seemingly everything's fine for Leuvenfish. But he's going to find out that it's tougher than it seems.
By the way, rook a c1 was a nice little move over defending this weakness on c4. That means Petrosia must look for a new weakness in white's position. How can we create one and what would be the weakness that Petrosian will play against? Knight d3 does not work because there's two attacking and once you move the knight in, I just take it and get two pieces. So that's no bueno. Plukra. So if you have an idea of what move should be the answer, do tell me why you make that move and what is the purpose of it all. So Kaparovic is pointing out that this bishop is not moving much, but it is kind of useful putting pressure on the h3 pawn. So it's not as bad as it might seem. Knight a6, knight b4 could be interesting. But as I pointed out, what and how can Petrosian create some extra weaknesses for Leuvenfish? What will be the weakness? So indeed, a3 is the big move. But what is the point of a3? Apart from fixing the structure, what will be the potential target? And it might not be that clear. And Gaborovich has a great point. After b3, even though we can't get close to that a2 pawn, the a2 pawn will be the weakness. And then we can do this maneuver mentioned by many of you, knight b4, playing against that a2 pawn. And note that this works pretty well with your bishop, because you can't ever go rook a1. That would run into these tactical tricks on the diagonal. And also, sometimes you can just post your bishop on b2, cutting the defense from the a2 pawn. Creating a weakness on a2. Knight a6, and this big maneuver is coming, playing as the a2 pawn. Camilo says, the unconnected rooks are giving me anxiety. I'll worry not. You can play bishop d7 whenever you want to. And it's kind of a semi-close position, so you don't have to worry about it that much. So here Levenfish plays rook d2, which may be a little bit too content, knight b4, queen b1, and now we'll have to decide how to continue with black. Who has more active pieces? Before we come up with solutions, what's going on over here? So rook d2 was trying to over defend this a2 pawn. That was the whole point of rook d2. So black all the way. Okay, I get it. But who has the more active pieces and what does that mean? So black's pieces are attacking. We say that it's active and those pieces are pretty active. And the white pieces are kind of passive, defending the weaknesses. Defending this guy, defending that one, this one. And in general, these guys are not 
to aggressively placed, or we still call it passive. Now, can we get can we get close to those pieces with black? That's the big question. Because even you see your opponent's pieces are passive, if you can't come close to them, you'll have a problem. Bill Chess, thank you for rating with a party of five. We're actually just looking at the King's Indian and trying to figure out how Petrosian was so good playing these openings. Ravels, thank you for following. So let's try to find out a way to play this. By the way, shout out to Will Chess. Do check him out. Mudge7900. Thank you for the follow. Will Chess, thank you for the follow. How does Black get his pieces more active? So I then checks what's fascinating about the game of chess is if you act right, you will be rewarded. So if you look at our pieces from a black perspective, which one of our pieces are not working at all? The rook, what else? So we talk about the rook and what else is not? The light square bishop is extremely passive on c8. Where would we love to put that bishop? I mean, we could put the bishop on e6, but it literally does nothing there. Let's attack the problem from this way. If this e pawn disappears, what move we would love to play? If that e pawn disappears, just whoosh disappears. Bishop f5 would be monstrous with threats against this queen. So now, after using the power of imagination, you can guess Petrosian's next move. D5. Opening the position for the c8 bishop. And now it is starting to fall into pieces. White is starting to struggle. C takes, C takes, E takes. But what if E takes, C takes, and F4? This is a possibility for Leuvenfish. Thank you for the follow, Nekonuke. So f4 has one big problem. What is that? The bishop on e3 lost its charger pawn, meaning it's not defended anymore. So we can wapow use it. Here's this very nice sack on c4. Yes, you can take here, but then the bishop is falling, and then Petrosian will be just up a pawn. So obviously, Leuvenfish didn't want to play that. Took on d5, he takes, and I takes d5. Look how the position has transformed. You have two amazing knights in the center attacking that bishop, and if that bishop is gone, 
that rook on d2 will become a target as well. And suddenly, Petrosian's advantage is quite big. So here, Leuvenfish panicked, but it's already kind of bad for white, as knight b4s will happen. And also, it's kind of clear that eventually Petrosian is going to overtake this position. So Leuvenfish just played b4, but there's knight takes b4, just dropping the pawn. Queen a4. And even though this queen looks awkward, it is well defended over there. Knight c5, queen a5, knight b7. And this does win the pawn back, but just runs into some tactical ideas. Rook b8, knight b3, then one knight d3. So let's say here I have knight d3, and there are some tactical issues. Knight b3. Queen b5, bishop g2, knight c4, and it's falling apart because white's pieces are not ready for the onslaught. Rook c4, queen c4, but this is the beginning of the end. Bishop f1, queen c3, bishop f4, bishop e5. Why is bishop e5 such a strong move here? I know this is already dominating for Petrosian, but why is bishop e5 still such a strong move? Bakalche, you're learning. I'm glad to hear that. What's the point of bishop e5? Point is, A, it removes the defender, B, white still has the bishop pair. So if you get the chance, you want to exchange it off. Bishop e5, rook takes e5, and as the rooks are marching down to the first rank, it'll be over. But queen d1 was a blunder. Your queen d1, knight a2, if you take, I take on b3. And it's a completely winning game. And if you check, that does not matter because I have king g7. And with an extra a pawn and the exchange, this is just a win. So in this game by Tigran Vartanovic, we saw that, yes, you can play this position even if the position is not totally crammed and closed. So this was a game no matter uno. Here comes game number two by Tigran Petrosian. He did resign after knight takes a2, yes. So how do you guys like the King's Indian so far? So, yeah, this one, and no, not members, yes, this is the one we've been looking for. So this game is by Borja Andersen, and again, our favorite. Vartanovic Petrosian. And in this game, we'll learn what should we do when there's opposite side castling. So what do you guys expect when we think about opposite side castling? Which side should you play on if your opponent is castled on the other side of the board? Made the king, Bokra says. Race for the king. And what's fascinating 
about the King's Indian, that is half the truth. But let's take a look. B4. And this is the King's Indian. F3, the Zamish. C6, E5, D5. Now, this is not the Benoni way of playing. This is kind of the mainstream and E6, but this is more of a Benoni structure. But Petrosian is looking for more of a King's Indian way of playing it. Play C6, E5, D5. Castles, Queen D2, takes, takes, A6. So if we're looking at this position, what would be our future plans? We don't know what moves going to be played. But if you look at the position, and you think about Black's plans, what would be your first idea? Your chat and viewers. So it's obvious that Borgia is going to castle long in the long future. So what will be our strategy? Are we going to play on the king side or the queen side? Queen side, I see. Yes, so we will have to play on the queen side. In fact, you'll see Vartanovic go and play knight d b5, knight d7, and knight b6. Castles, b5. The point is mostly gaining space. And then, from after playing knight b6, then to continue either with knight c4 or go with b4, a5. In both cases, Black is trying to find some good spots for the b8 knight. King b1, knight d7, rook c1, knight b6. In fact, I'm not a big fan of this king b1 move. I might have needed to play bishop d3 and knight e2. Why? Because of the following. Here. Knight b6, stopping knight g2, because knight g2 runs into knight c4. And once white loses the dark squared bishop, black is just having a nice game. This does look like a Sicilian in some ways. So now, White is forced to play bishop d3, knight e2, can go knight e2 because of this aforementioned idea. Knight d1, just trying to play against this knight c4 move, knight d7. So why does Petrosian play knight d7 in this position? What's the point of it at all? Yep. Black is preparing f5. And this is kind of the typical thing about the King's Indian. You always want to play for f5, even if your opponent is castled on the other side of the board. Why is Black so poised to play for f5? Why is black trying to play f5? What's the idea behind that? Exactly. We want to activate this bishop because if that happens, our attack becomes quite real and strong. 
Also, after we play f5, there is a target, namely on e4. g4, a very nice typical idea by white playing against the f5 break. Now, do we get dissuaded by this? Does it matter that they play g4 or not? Now, don't forget, whenever you're playing the King's Indian, you play like a boss. Would a boss care that your opponent just played g4? Nope. f5. Even though this will lead to some weaknesses in front of the black king, but on the other hand, black's pieces will be quite active. Gf, Gf, Bishop d3. And knight f6. Okay, so all of you who just joined, welcome. We are mostly focusing on how to play the King's Indian according to Petrosian. You're not focusing on the openings or on the theory, but on the core concepts. So knight f6. Let's stop here for a second. What has black achieved so far? We are far ahead in development. Why this kind of lagging? Why it would need to play knight g2, and in fact, Borja didn't play knight g2 and rook g1, which would provide good play for white. Probably knight g2 had to be played. Borja didn't do that. Now, who has the open C file? I would still argue that's mostly a benefit for white. So what are we targeting mostly with black? The center, we are trying to undermine this e4 pawn. So Bourget played rook c6, which is a mistake. Now g2 would have been better in hopes of rook g1, and white has some sort of an attack. Also, don't forget, you can't really take on f5 because we have too much pressure on this pawn on d5, in that case. So this would have been better with some hopes for an attack, but Borgia thought rook c6 is forcing and puts pressure on the b6 knight. But he didn't expect, he did not expect uh, Tigran Vartanovic on fire. So it's iron Tigran to move and play and have a merciless attack. So not out of this world. The move won't be out of this world. But still a nice one. Well, you want to sack? Well, maybe you get, you'll get the chance to do so. <clears throat> I 
So I see moves. I see knight d5, rook b8, knight c4. But I want to hear some arguments. Why would you play rook b8? Why would you play knight c4? What's the idea behind that? And don't give me that it is logical, just logical. You're not a Vulcan. You can't just tell me, oh, it's just logical. No, I don't accept that. Talk to me like Vulcan to Vulcan. It is given that it's logical. Give me a reason why you think it's good. Rook b8, okay, let's see. Knight c4 to open the b file. Knight d5 to take pawns, okay. Well, that looks a little dangerous for black to do so. Okay, so I see knight c4. Actually, this was played by Tigran Vartanovich. Alhorns, thank you for following. Tori! Hello, Tori. We're just looking at some King's Indian games by the legendary world champion Tigran Petrosian. By the way, shout out to Tori, the legendary player. Do check her out. So knight c4 was played. So it opens up the b file. What else does it do? You're attacking the bishop and the queen. So why does force to do something? Force is white to take on c4. But that means that something is lost for Borge. What is that? Why loses the bishop pair? Correcto. El correcto. That's a positive for black. Also, now this bishop on c8 will be the only one ruling the white squares. <clears throat> so bc, knight c3. And I'm sure that at this moment, Borja felt that, ah, oh, this position is just wonderful. What does Mr. Tigran Vartanovich trying to do against me here? And the fact is, this rook and knight are still parking in the garage. And I don't Tigran knows when the moment is right to attack. So it's time to attack like Vartanovich, the Iron Tigran. It's black to move and win. And winning is a little bit early, but like does get the initiative. So note that white is a move away from getting the knight to e2, and then white will be in somewhat of a control. PSQ says f4, but if you play f4, I might as well just play bishop b6, hit your queen, get my knight to e2, and I'm not sure you're winning. So, of course, f takes e4, f takes e4, and here's the critical moment. 
channel your inner Tal or your inner Iron Tigron, whichever you like. Don't be shy. Donate your piece for an attack. Yes, yeah, knight takes e4. Very nice sacrifice. Takes, and now a critical move, which is very important. Make sure that these guys are still stranded on h1 and g1. Yeah, rook f1 check. You can't block. Because I'll take all of them. King c2. Bishop f5. Pin in it. And it'll be kind of tough to move around. Queen g2. Which is tricky, by the way. Because it does attack this rook on f1. But does that bother us? That's the big question. That's the big question. Yeah, panic mode should be engaging right about now. To cry, right. Oh yeah, Tori, yes, of course, doing great. We're just looking at some of these Petrosian games. And we're trying to marvel in his glory. And his great skills in the King's Indian. So far, looks fascinating and fun. So where are the loose pieces for white? So I understand you guys have an idea of the next move. But mostly, I guess the issue is that the queen and king are all both on white squares. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, queen h4. Big point being, if you take, for one, I can take on e4 and that attack looks menacing. But if push comes to shove, I can also just take here and take the rook. And that's kind of the main issue for Borja, as both of the queen and the rook is on white squares, not even talking about this king, which is in deep trouble. Rook takes c4. And rook takes c4 is kind of admitting that this attack is coming faster than a train. We need to find a move that will just put the nail in the coffin for Borja. So just like we love batteries, we love putting our pieces on the first rank because it usually signals, I am going to mate you fairly soon. And as Ninja Capo says, it's time to drop the hammer. Queen E1. Getting all of our guys on the first. This rook is stuck in there. We can't move the knight. Because I'll take after check, of course. I'm not going to blunder the queen. And not only we keep this rook on that parking square, we also have pressure on the e4 knight, the bishop on e3, and queen d1 is getting closer to checkmate. 
Now, queen e1 is danger. King d3, just running, running, but it's dangerous. And the end is nigh, as we can predict that. And here, Bartanovich plays rook b8. What's the point of rook b8, chat? Any ideas? Why rook b8 is so strong? Because in fact, it is quite powerful. Just bringing more pieces to the attack, exactly. So even if you're attacking, bringing some extra fodder and some extra pieces to the attack, that's always a good news. That's what, something you should do. Because with more pieces, it's way more likely for you to checkmate. So here, Borgia is trying to hold it all together, trying to defend all the pieces, but we can state that that king on d3 cannot feel that good. Just lover, just take a look at that king on d3. It's not really chilling there. So if that king is not enjoying its time or vacation on d3, how can Petrosian use that fact? Yeah, that king, as Ninja Capo points out, straight up not having a good time. So before we start exchanging stuff, let me remind you of the fact that we're down a piece. Because according to my secret method of counting pieces. This is one, two, three, and this is one, two. And according to that high level math, it means black is down a whole piece. If you don't checkmate, you lose the game. So you've got to find some nice attacking moves. Find some weaknesses in Borges position. Don't look for cool moves, look for good ones. So if you look at the position, where can we find a potential target? which is kind of close to this king on d3. The d5 pawn, exactly. How can we can, how can we get close to that d5 pawn? Rook b5 is a way. How else? You know, if you see one good move, look for a better one. Yeah, queen a5. Munching on that d5 pawn. And we have even more pressure on that pony. Queen a5. Just dancing around the board. Look at that queen go. Look at that. What a queen. What a queen. And obviously, this is the beginning of the end.
bishop d2, queen takes d5, king e2. Let's defend this f1 rook. And probably the last move is the prettiest of all. And indeed, it is a rook f8, which I'll give it a modest double x clam. The point being, if you take on f8, there's bishop e4. In a game, there was knight f3, which was a joke, because of course, I can't take the rook. But if you take on f1, I take on e4 and go full Pac-Man on your position. And you're completely losing. So rook f8 is a very stylish move, which basically points out that Borgia does not have any useful moves anymore. And bishop g4, bishop h6 will be very mate-like. Let's say I play something random. Bishop c3, there is this very pretty checkmating idea. Look at those bishops cutting into the position. Well, it is a matter of taste. I find rook f8 a beautiful one. So this was game number two of Petrosian's King's Indian. This is how he destroyed Andersen's Zamesh. Let's take a look at another game where he faced Gideon Stahlberg. Add a new chapter. Add this game. So Stahlberg was a strong grandmaster. And we're going to learn what to do if the position closes up. Here's the link. Shocking! Another King's Indian. Knight f3, knight d7, e5. Same play as we saw in the Leuvenfish Petrosian game. Look right, yes, I saw that game. Yes, I will. Life is life. So e5, e4, rook e8. As we've seen before, this is Petrosian's staple. He plays rook e8 and asks, what are you going to do about this weakness? Are you going to close the position or are you not? In the Leuvenfish game, we saw Leuvenfish keep the tension. But Stahlberg decides to close it. E5. So this position is a little bit different. Our rook is on e8 instead of f8. How does that change the position? It is the same setting. But the strategy might differ a little bit now. What's the benefit of having the rook on e8 and what's the problem with having the rook on e8? There's our pros and cons. The knight cannot move to e8. That's true. That is a fact. Can we play for f5 right now? 
Can we play for f5 in this type of position? Not yet. Why can't we really play for f5 immediately? Because this rook is misplaced for that. It's not ready. It should be on f8. And then you could go knight d8 and f5. And even then you would want to prepare that with h6. So this rook e8 is not ideally placed in the moment. So, as you guys point out, he starts playing with a5 and knight c5. Knight c5. Gideon is trying to get the knight to d3. Knight c5. And here White plays bishop g5. What do you guys think of this move? Do you like bishop g5? Don't you like bishop g5? Or would you love to play bishop g5? So how many of you like bishop g5? It's okay-ish, I see. Yeah? So it's not particularly good. Probably, as Chad mentions, knight d3 would be a better move with a normal position. Bishop g5, h6. Exactly. You ask, what are you trying to accomplish with this move? Bishop takes f6. He takes f6. So let's stop here yet again. Bishop g5, in fact, is not such a dangerous idea here. And as Ninja Capo points out, he's calling the bluff. Black has the bishop pair, but does that count in closed positions? The answer is it does. Even in closed positions, the bishop pair can be very useful. Why? Because once the position opens up, you'll get two very strong pieces with those bishops on g7 and c8. But as again, Jokal points out, f4 kind of loses its strength because once we open up the position, this bishop is unmatched on g7. A3, and A3 is the move that we should jump at, A3 is a wrong. And of course, A4, B3 would have been much better kind of preparing this idea of rook B1, A3, and B4. Would have been better. But Stahlberg played a3, a4, fixing the structure and no more ways to break through. Rook b1, kind of a pointless move. Bishop d7. Look how Vartanovich is not rushing, he's just stabilizing his position. There's no need to rush. h4. How should we react against this pawn push of h4? The bishop is pretty good on d7. That's correct. It defends this pawn and can be useful whenever we are playing for future f5 ideas. So I played h4. How should we react to h4? Or do we need to react? Uh, 
So white is trying to play h5, and we really don't want to play g5. That would be annoying, and that'd be a bad structure. Lolly to the rescue. h5 is obvious. Well, it is obvious because we really don't want to have a structure where white gets h5 in, and we'll have to play g5. The f5 square might become terribly bad, and also the g7 bishop would be horrible. So h5 is a good move. Also prepares ideas of activating the bishop through h6. King h2. And Petrosian's next move shows some deep foresight. What are we going to play for in this position with black? As a long term plan. Which break are we looking for? Obviously, f5. And if we want to play f5, there'll be plenty of moves that we want to make. Queen d8, and then play f5. But Petrosian is very good strategically. He prepares with rook f8, and then plans to go queen d8 and f5. Bishop h3. And how should we continue here if we know our plans? I see queen e7, bishop e8, queen d8. Hmm. How about winning the chess game? How about that? So Petrosian likes to play so positional chess, but if he gets the chance to win, he wins the game. There's a black to move and win. How can black crush through? Crash through, that is. Boom! Take it. Takes. And knight takes e4. So even though the king's Indian is a strategic opening, tactics can also work in your favor. The main problem for Stahlberg is you can't take on e4 because queen e5 check, and I can take on e4. Takes queen f5 check. You can push the pawn, but I will take the piece instead of the pawn. And black is just dominating. Boda says bishop h3 is so strange. You are not correct, sir. So in this type of position, obviously Stahlberg should have played queen e2, over defending and then go bishop h3. Why is bishop h3 strategically sound? It is strategically sound because he's trying to get rid of black's bishop pair. So on basic grounds, Stahlberg wasn't wrong, but on a tactical perspective, it wasn't sound.
meaning tactically it was flawed, but from a positional perspective, it was well based and correct. Tactics, and that's why you always look out for tactics on e4, especially now you lose the pawn and the game is collected. Now we are going to spare this part of the game because Stahlberg went on to lose quite easily. We are not going to look at this one. But last but not least, there is a game played between Pologayevsky and Petrosian. I want to show you guys. So, for all of you who don't know who Pologayevsky is, now, you've seen games with d5 pawn sacrifices in the Queen's Indian. Fact is, he is the one who invented it. He is the mastermind of opening theory in the 70s, 80s, and a bit in the 90s. Also, there is a Neudorf variation named after him, the Polugayevsky variation. So whoever claims that d5 was someone else's brainchild, they're wrong. Polugayevsky was there first. Polugayevsky is awesome. I agree, Alexei, 2539. So, without further ado, let's look at that game. So this game is between Lev Polugayevsky and Tigran Petrosyan. He was a hardworking and a true opening expert. D4, not shocking, as Polugayevsky was mostly a 1D4 player. D6. Here, here in the King's Indian. Castles, a6 and knight c6. Now this is not the line that we've been looking at because previously Bartanovich played in ID7 and e5, but he mixes it up this time. H3, rook b8. So far, so good. But what is Petrosian trying to play for in these type of positions? I wonder. Chat, any ideas what Black is preparing? This is, by the way, called the Pano variation. He's playing for b5. So he is kind of evacuating his pieces from the diagonal. If d5, there's knight a5 hitting this pawn, and there's c5, b5, sort of a Benoni slash Banco type of play. And that's coming up next if d5 is played. But Polugayevsky played a4. Question is, how did Petrosian react to a4? So clearly, there is no more b5 breaks. Too many pieces stopping that break. And if you have an idea what Petrosian played, try to reason why you think that is so good, or what could be the point behind it. So out of those illegal moves mentioned in chat, a5 is the right move. Point being, you stop the expansion, b, this will give a juicy b4 spot for the pony. e4, e5. And if black were to place d5, what would be play with black? 
Gaborovich says, I love the dynamic change from plant to plant. Yep. This is the King's Indian, all right. Obviously, we would play knight b4. We worked hard for that square, so we might as well use it. And after b6, we basically consolidate on the queen side. That is just a good sign, because then we can start playing for our favorite f5 plan. Mkaz Chess, thank you for following. So black originally was playing for this b5 break, was stopped, but Petrosian decided, okay, after a4, I change plans. This should be e3. So Pologayevsky, just like Leuvenfish, keeps it nice and tense. Dave Hamet, 98, thank you for following. And here... Petrosian plays knight d7, which might look a little strange. But the idea is the following. Once we exchange on d4, I will have spots on b4 and c5. Also, if you decide to close the position, let's say here, can go knight e7 or b4, but this is obviously more logical, I am ready to play f5. I mean, obviously I'm going to prepare it, so there's no knight g5 funny business. But after that, I have f5 ready. So that's what he's trying to do there. He's trying to prepare that idea. Knight d5. Knight d5 gets an exclamation mark. Because it stops this idea of knight b4. And also creates tension in the center. So, how should we proceed here with black? Good night, Tango is Somerset. So remember, the position is still tense. Then, can we go for a mating attack? No, we can't. If we can't go for a mating attack, what can we do? Tango Summer said, thank you for the tier 1 sub. Thank you for subscribing. Need more development. Okay, so if we need more development, how can we accomplish that? Can try to target the e4 pawn. Mm. Fiddle saying fianchettoing the bishop? No, you don't want to ever go bishop b6, bishop b7. You're creating targets along the diagonal. You don't want that. So we want to put pressure on this e4 pawn. Therefore, Mr. Iron Tigran played rook e8. Obviously, he takes d4 is an old idea. h6, f5 is not so good. Possible, but a little bit dodgy as the position is still tense and Pologayevsky can open up the position anytime he likes to. So he plays rook e8. Preparing to break in the center. Oh, 
but also keeping it tense. DE DE You could consider it knight takes, but then bishop g5 can be very annoying. Actually not, because knight f3, so that's not a problem. But takes, takes, and this is just good. Obviously this is bad because knight f3, and you lose the piece. But after takes, takes queen c2, white still has a bit more space. So white is slightly better. And note, with one knight, you can only occupy one square. You can't occupy two. Therefore, de is played as Petrosian feels he needs both of those ponies. Rook a3, which is a little bit of a weird move. I don't think that's too good. Probably queen d2, rook d1 would have been better. But Polugayevsky is being creative. Maybe a bit too creative as well. Rook a3. And now let's try to find the right moves for Petrosian. You already know what we're trying to achieve. And we already know what Polugayevsky is trying to achieve as well. He wants to play rook d3. Chess game is about achieving your own plans and stopping your opponent's ideas. Hello, Lion King Rip. Knight b4. Stopping this idea. And if they take, you can always take back and defend that pawn. You're also stopping that rook d3 idea. Lion King Rip, thank you for following. Queen d2, knight f6. Looking for counterplay, putting pressure on the e4 pawn. Now this knight on d5 looks annoying, but we can always kick it out with c6. So the reason... Petrosian plays these aggressive moves is to push back Pologayevsky's pieces, stopping ideas such as rook d3. That's why it's such a good move, Ponto. Bishop g5. And an important move that is coming up next for Mr. Petrosian. And this actually relates to the mantra that I usually say. Whenever you can, what do you need to do? If you're up some pieces, doesn't matter. You've got to. You've got to do what? In order to get all of your troops in, you've got to develop them pieces. Bishop e6, so undermining this knight, connecting the rooks. We don't care about pawns, because have bishop d5, and that knight would be hanging. So let's say takes, takes, and this is hanging. And sooner or later, we'll play c6. h6 is not quite possible, because I can take on f6 and win the h6 pawn at the end. So bishop a6. And we're getting ready to undermine the position. Rook d1. And now that we developed, can Tigran Petrosian come up with some Nice ideas. SRJ96, thank you for following. Back to move. And conquer. Let's 
Conquer. I'm waiting for statements, ideas, moves for black, not questions. Whether that move works or not, it's for you to find. Because even in the chess game, you can quite ask your opponent, Hey, hey, buddy, did you blunder your queen? Did you miss checkmate? You can't do that. Also, they wouldn't like it. Just telling you up front, that's frowned upon. Okay? Keep that in mind. It's very important. So, of course, knight takes e4. Yep, the queen is hanging, but so does the queen on d2. Takes, knight takes d2. And this is again a mini combination. If rook takes, we take this bishop, and we're just much better. Also, if you take, we'll be able to move this knight away. In fact, this is what happened. Bishop takes d8, knight takes d2. Bishop takes c7, and White felt that this should be good for him. But it's I don't take round to move and dominate. Let's channel our inner Iron Tigran. So if you're looking at the activity of the pieces, who has the better and more active pieces in general? And with that, it'll be much easier to find the solution. Black has the more active pieces. What should we do with this knight on d2? If you have better pieces, why give them away? Why not just use them? Knight c4. Now you didn't expect Tigran Partanovic to part with his rook, did you? Did you not? Of course he does so. He says, yes, I have very good pieces. I don't care if you get the exchange. My pieces are just way more active than yours. So I'm going to take on c4 and not exchange around. Bishop b8, bishop d5. And in fact, the situation is so good, the a3 is hanging, and the bishop is hanging as well on b8. So what Vartanovic thought, I mean, Tigran Petrosian, is whenever he takes on c4, not only he gets a better position, he keeps those active pieces on the board. If you take on f3, you actually liquidate and you just exchange of all those pieces that you could use for an attack. That's why knight c4 is better, because now black has way more active pieces, and this knight and bishop is not doing that much at the moment. Bishop d5, bishop a7, e4. Again, no rush to take the knight 
I mean, to take on a3 with the knight. He says, e4, I just want to activate my pieces and will take the exchange back whenever I feel it. Correct and right. Exactly, Ninja Capo. Keep the bishop locked in the little cage. Exactly. Knight g5. And again, Tigran Petrosian to move and find a very nice little twist in this position. So first off, think about which pieces that you can trap in Pologayevsky's position. So I see b6. You can't really take because b a and these guys are being attacked. b6 is an idea. You can take on b2. What else? Remember, you find a good move, try to find a better one. Yeah, I see the overwhelming h6, exactly. The knight has nowhere to run. And if you can get two pieces for the rook, that is nearly winning. And here h6 is a monstrous move by Petrosian. This knight on g5 is trapped. And it is basically game over. Rook b3, bishop c6, not letting bishop b, rook b4, that is, to work. So if it takes, then this bishop would fall. And probably still winning, but Vartanovic is very technical. And he doesn't allow that to happen. Well, Polgarevsky had a bad position. He tried to muddy waters. But that does not always work. Knight e4, bishop a4. But now, with two connected pass pawns after this b pawn falls, it's just going to be over. Polugevsky, in desperation, took on b4, a b, b3, bishop takes b3, and now this position is just. Completely winning. Rook b1, knight b2, just shielding this pawn and bishop on b4 and b3, respectively. And Great Tessenberg is correct. This is not even a metaphor. It is just going down for the legendary Lev Polugayevsky. Knight d6. Rook e7, just defending everything. Bishop c5, bishop c2. Rook a1, knight a4. And the sad truth is, my b pawn is running to become a lady. And there's nothing you can do about it. Not at all go away, I'll just push it, and you're just lost. So Pologayevsky took, takes, bishop b4, bishop c6, again, trying to exchange pieces. When you're winning, try to exchange them all, if possible. Bishop f1, rook d7, bishop b5, pinning it, knight b6, and after rook d1, it's over, because once the king moves, take on f1 and there's not much you could do so after rook d1 the game was over this was played and the game was over so this was the lecture for the king's indian with the legend that is tigran petrosian 
iron tigram. Probably going to do future lectures as well. Anti Fakab, thank you for following. Probably going to do that in the future as well. We're going to have practice tournaments coming up in the King's Indian. So if you're interested in that, do check out our Discord and our Facebook so you're up to date with that. And before we go, let's go to my chair. Hope you had fun. Hope you learned some. And hope you'll be around for some tournaments and some other lectures. And with that, I hope you had fun. Take care. Bye-bye.